narrator then describes the madness of Don Quixote by way of his heroic preferences. The Cid, the knight of the burning sword, Bernardo del Carpio. This last knight is of particular interest to Don Quixote because he killed the French knight Roland in the famous Battle of Roncevalles in 778. The narrator tells us that Don Quixote noted some affiliation between Bernardo del Carpio and Hercules, the classical hero always associated with Spain, as can be seen in the Pillars of Hercules found on early modern Spanish coins and coats of arms. Then we have the curious detail of Don Quixote's appreciation of the giant Morgante. He likes the giant almost as much as Amadis because he was pleasant and well-mannered. In the end, however, and in contrast to the rest of the novel, Don Quixote identifies more with Reinaldos de Montalban. The narrator tells us that the Hidalgo liked it when he saw him emerge from his castle and rob everyone he met. Not exactly honorable behavior. Then he adds that Don Quixote also liked it when he went overseas and stole that idol of Muhammad made of gold. These are important details for understanding political and religious aspects of the late 16th century. At first glance, it makes sense that Don Quixote should identify with Reynaldos de Montalban, considering that a poor Spanish Hidalgo would be tempted to steal something from Muhammad. But the problem is that Islam famously proscribes all forms of idolatry. So there are no idols of Muhammad made of gold or any other material. At the very end of this series of heroes, we find another curious identification, or rather opposition. The narrator tells us that the protagonist hates the traitor Ganelon, and that he would sacrifice his housekeeper and even his own niece to give him a handful of kicks. Beyond another comic but serious confusion of moral values, here Don Quixote expresses anger against the man who betrayed Roland and made possible the victory at Roncevalles by Bernardo del Carpio, with whom Don Quixote identified earlier. So wait a minute, who is Don Quixote for at Roncevalles? Is he for Roland and Charlemagne or their enemies Bernardo del Carpio and Ganelon? This is precisely the kind of contrary and ironic detail that characterizes the style of Cervantes at the pinnacle of his literary career. Or is there no contradiction at all here? Aren't traitors detestable regardless? Cervantes now turns to the Hidalgo's motives for venturing forth. After this frenzied and chaotic review of chivalric heroes, the narrator reminds us that, having been consumed by madness, Don Quixote determined to become a knight errant. And he did so, we should note, both to increase his personal honor and to serve his country. Don Quixote's crazy idea indicates a personal crisis, but it also relates to national politics. Don Quixote sets out with weapons and a horse to undo all types of grievances, undertaking this imaginary attempt to make the world good according to the adventures he has read in the books of chivalry. Don Quixote dreams that he will obtain by the might of his own arm, at the very least, the crown of the empire of Trebizond. By the way, it was precisely Reynaldos de Montalban who became emperor of Trebizond, located on the southern coast of the Black Sea in northern Turkey. Here as elsewhere, Don Quixote seems to display the traits of the mythological conquerors of Moors like the Cid or Saint James, Santiago de Matamoros in Spanish. It is important not to miss what is funny about all of this? Don Quixote is ridiculous, tragic, yes, even pathetic, but his agitation is described as laughable. A great example is the first physical act in the novel. Don Quixote cleans up the weapons of his great-grandfathers, a pathetic detail being the fact that they are covered in rust and mold. Then he has to build a lattice helmet. He does this by adding a bit of cardboard to a morion, a common conquistador's helmet. This process is hilarious. According to the narrator, it is true that to test if it was solid enough to withstand blows, he drew his sword and gave it two whacks, and with the first of these, he broke what he had taken a week to fashion. After this first attempt, Don Quixote builds another helmet, and this time, he was satisfied with its strength, and not wanting to investigate further, he declared it a fine lattice salad. Now we turn to Cervantes' presentation of Don Quixote's famous horse, Rocinante. This is one pathetic nag. The Latin phrase, tantum pelis et ossa fuit, indicates that he is all skin and bones, but Don Quixote thinks he has the grandeur of famous war horses, like Alexander the Great's Bucephalus or the Cid's Babieca. 
As with the construction of his helmet, the hero has trouble finding an appropriate name for his horse. In the end, he hits on Rocinante, which combines the pathos of nag, rocin in Spanish, and the glorious sounding suffix ante, the four in English. There's humorous wordplay here. The narrator tells us that the name indicated what it had been before when it was a nag, previous to what it had now become, which was first and foremost of all the nags in the world. Notice how the narrator is gaining prominence, mixing his views with those of the protagonist, allowing his pen to follow subordinate clauses wherever they lead. Before we leave Rocinante, let's look at the first phrase used to describe him. He had more quarter cracks than a piece of eight. This is one of the first metaphors in the entire novel. We should not take it lightly. Rocinante is as pathetic as Don Quixote, and the narrator alludes to a disease which affects horses by fracturing their hooves. Additionally, however, this is the first of Cervantes's many references to the disastrous monetary inflation of 17th century Spain, which caused the smaller denominated billon coins to be worth less and less with respect to the silver dollar. Officially 68 maravedis, or slightly more than four quarter coins each with a face value of 16 maravedis, amounted to a real, or a piece of eight. In reality, however, around 1605, when Don Quixote is published, nobody in their right mind was interested in receiving quarters because Habsburg officials had extracted all of their silver content. Thus, the first phrase used to describe Rocinante seems casual, comic. It is, however, a very complicated reference to the monetary debasement that would hasten the destruction of the Spanish economy. In Rocinante, we see the fundamental symbol of chivalric heroism corrupted at its base. A kind of national ruin, an economic disease, rises up through the hooves of the crusading warhorse, debilitating it prior to the first sally of our Manchegan knight.